Good evening. Um, I'm uh, Anthony Painter. I'm Director of Policy and Strategy here at the RSA, um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to this evening's event. Um, before we begin, uh, just a quick reminder, we're recording tonight's event, so please could you switch your mobile phones to silent. Um, we're also live streaming over the RSA website, so welcome to all our online viewers. Um, and do get involved in the discussion on Twitter using the hashtags, hashtag RSA Enterprise and hashtag Dragons. Um, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's special event and to welcome our distinguished speakers. Um, unfortunately, we received apologies for Mariana Mazzucatu, but we still have an absolutely stellar lineup. First of all, there's Liam Byrne. Um, Liam chairs the All Party Parliamentary Group on Inclusive Growth, which works with parliamentarians, businesses, trade unions, and others. He's written in depth about Britain's future, um, and in his presentation this evening, he'll draw lessons from the history of Britain um, as set out in his new book, um, Dragons. Here it is. Ten entrepreneurs who built Britain, and it's absolutely superb, but we'll hear more from Liam himself. Um, Liam will be exploring the ideas and people that help create the modern commercial world with our esteemed panellists, Sherry Kutu and Sir Martin Sorrell. Sherry is an entrepreneur, non-executive director, investor, advisor to companies, universities, charities, shall I go on? <laughs> She's author of the Scalar Report on UK Economic Growth. Um, she has many years of experience in the technology and education sectors and is chair of the charity Founders for Schools um, and a trustee of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, Sir Martin is CEO and founder of WPP, um, the world's largest marketing communications group. Um, Martin actively supports the advancement of international business schools, advising the Harvard Business School, and the Ind Indian School of Business, and many others. Um, we're going to hear uh, first from Liam on lessons of entrepreneurial history um, and the productivity challenge um, that Britain faces today. Um, Sherry outlined the need for more small companies to scale up and the role of policymakers. And Sir Martin will bring insights on creative leadership in the new global economy. Um, we, the RSA, are delighted to be hosting tonight's event. Um, also drawing on a rich past, the RSA believes that creativity underpins commercial and social progress. Our recent work on self-employment and a sharing economy underpins this belief. So it is, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Liam Byrne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Anthony, thank you very much. So uh, nearly 20 years ago, I was uh, innocently sitting in an auditorium slightly less grand than this, uh, blissfully unaware that my life was about to change forever. And uh, like Sherry and Martin, I had just started at Harvard Business School. I was just about to take a course on the making of America. And over the months that followed, I just sat there awestruck by some of the most captivating stories that I'd ever heard. This was history like I'd never heard it before. It was history that wasn't full of facts and figures. It was full of the flesh and blood of these extraordinary entrepreneurs who made America. And I was just completely hooked. So within the space of a year, I had uh, convinced my wife that it was a brilliant idea for me to turn down all of my job offers and spend several months uh, living on our credit card, starting a business. Um, and Sarah, who uh, was six months pregnant at the time, uh, took it pretty heroically, I think it's fair to say. Um, but I decided one thing more, that one day I would try and write the book about how Britain was made, not with a load of facts and figures, but with the flesh and blood of the great entrepreneurs who helped build this country, a country that is still now the world's fifth biggest economy. So 16 years later, um, here it is. I can't quite promise that it's uh, Horrible Histories meets The Apprentice, but there is, um, there's plenty of cat fights, there's buckets of drama, and it's not full of facts and figures. It is full of these incredible stories that have just been absolutely extraordinary to write. And the simple truth that emerges from it all is this. This is country of ours. It was not just built by sovereigns and statesmen. It wasn't just built by soldiers and scientists. It was built by some of the greatest entrepreneurs on the planet. It was built by buccaneers like Robert Rich, who founded the great colonies and companies of North America. It was founded by merchants like Thomas Diamond Pitt, who created great trading empires and multinationals amidst the old economies of the East. 
It was created by, by industrial revolutionaries like Matthew Bolton, who perfected the steam engine that pumped the mines and drove the forges and the factories of the Industrial Revolution. It was created by great capitalists like Nathan Rothschild, who down the road founded the world's great bond market. It was created by people like William Jardine, um, who forced the argument for free trade in the early 19th century. It was built by visionaries like Cadbury and Lever, who brought mass production to everything from chocolate to soap and brought the products of the whole world to every corner of the country. And for a nation of shopkeepers, our economy was also built by business genius like John Speed and Lewis. And these have been absolutely amazing stories to write, and I hope they're amazing stories to read, because what I never expected was the lesson that writing this book taught me about politics and about life. Because the truth is, this book was very nearly not written. Um, during the course of last year, I was quite unsure as to whether actually I'd have the strength to do it. Um, because, you see, although I loved startup land, although I loved being an entrepreneur, I'm actually the son of two public servants, a science teacher and a council worker. And when my mum died of cancer when she was just 52, I knew at that stage that I was going to have to follow them into public service one day. And so I decided to stand for Parliament, and I was lucky. I got elected and clambered up the greasy pole fairly quickly, and I did all the difficult jobs that no one wanted to do, and I tackled them with gusto, and, well, you know, it didn't make me too many friends, and I made a lot of enemies along the way, and I made a lot of mistakes along the way, principal amongst which was, of course, my leaving note at the Treasury, <laughs> joking that there was no money. And, of course, David Cameron picked up that stick and he used it to beat us remorselessly throughout the last election. Were you, were you joking? Well, I, I look back in retrospect and I think, gosh, if only we had debt that level today. But, you know, that, um, that stick, which, uh, which was sort of, you know, beaten around our head, it brought me a, it brought me a tremendous sense of public shame. But what, of course, I couldn't say at the time was that that was completely overwhelmed by the private shame I'd felt as I lost my father to a 20-year struggle against alcohol. So after the last election, I was at an all-time low. His death and uh, our election defeat just brought me to my, to my lowest ebb. And it was at that moment that I just was not sure what on earth I was going to do. I was, you know, considering leaving public life. And I took myself off to see the wisest man I know, who is my uncle, a great man who's been through everything, and he, he walked me up to the top of the cliff at the back of his house where he lives in Dorset and overlooking the English Channel, he gave me this extraordinary advice that I had never heard before. And it's a line from Samuel Beckett. He said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. And I'd never heard it before. But I suddenly saw that that was the wisdom in each and every one of these entrepreneurial stories. All the entrepreneurs in this book, they have tried and they failed and picked themselves up and done it all again. They've taken Kipling's advice to look at triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Robert Rich was almost hounded out the country by Charles I. He was about to emigrate before his fortune turned. Um, Thomas Diamond Pitt made a fortune, lost a fortune fighting the French, and then had to pick himself up and do it all again. Matthew Bolton is constantly on the brink of bankruptcy, and when the Millers burn down Albion Mill just down the river, he almost loses everything. He's got to pick himself up and do it all again. The Cadbury brothers were on the brink of bankruptcy for much of their early career until they found a way of turning the corner. And John Speed and Lewis almost died as a young man. He lost the lung, was in protracted battles with his father for much of his early career until he found a way to overcome and build the business that is John Lewis today. So each of these entrepreneurs understands and proves through the story of their own life that it's not enough to have the audacity of hope. You need the tenacity of hope too. And that's the political lesson that I draw from the book for the economic debates of today. Because look around the world, look around the debate, the truth is that capitalism is not in good odour. Growth is flat, flat on its back. People like Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary in the US, says that we're now mired in this age of secular stagnation. Robert Gordon's just written this whopping great book called The Rise and Fall of American Growth that's got the cheery message that, well, our best days are behind us. Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager, says that the big global businesses that now dominate the commanding heights of the global economy, they're not investing 
in the economies and the industries and the jobs of the future. So, of course, voters are angry. And they're looking for radical solutions from Donald Trump to Brexit. But the lesson of history is this. Entrepreneurs are the answer. We could turn our back on the world. We could try and turn back the clock. We could try and stop the world and get off. But actually, it's not going to work. We need the kind of animal spirits that I talk about in this book to drive the entrepreneurial surge that is going to unlock the industries of the future, whether that is in big data or driverless cars or genetic engineering or the Internet of Things. You know, you name it. We need the entrepreneurial spirits of this country to turn ideas into new industries and new industries into new jobs. And the truth is that in this country, we've got a hell of a lot going for us. We have 2 million more businesses than we had at the turn of the century. 40% of Europe's unicorns, those start-up billion-dollar businesses, they're based here in the UK. At the next election, there will be more self-employed people in this country than public service workers. But here is the inconvenient truth. We are doing nowhere near enough. We have a million people have left entrepreneurial activity in the last three years alone. We are 48th out of 60 in the global enterprise lead table. Of the top 300 companies created in the last 30 years, only a few of them are British. Look at the top 100 websites, only a couple of them are British, and actually they're kind of American, google.co.uk and amazon.co.uk. And that is why we need this big debate about how we create the next generation of world beaters. And you know, for my money, there are no better two people to comment on this than Sherry um, and Martin. But I think we need this debate about how we spread enterprise to every school and every college. We need this debate about how we get government buying more from scale-up businesses that create the lion's share of new jobs. We need a finance system that works better. We need to raise the investment we make as a country in science and research and development. We need to get all of these things right because what 600 years of business history teaches you is basically this. Entrepreneurs create history by inventing the future. But if each of us wants a better future in this country, then we need our entrepreneurs not just to fail better, but to succeed. And that is the lesson that Dragons teaches us. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Can we ask you any questions or not? Um, let's get a response from Ethan. Well, I just one thing I want to do. Right, so <laughs> on June the 23rd, will the, depending on what, what difference will the vote make on June the 23rd, do so you I hypothesis? I think it's going to be dead close. But the other thing that surprised No, 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 no not what the decision is. But let's say yeah. we, we come out. Is that good for entrepreneurialism? It's, or? it's actually catastrophic. Okay. And what I hadn't realised as I went back through the centuries, back to actually to the, the 1250s when... Britain's first rest control of the, the fleet and finance business from the Italians and the Dutch. We've been doing business on the continent for seven, eight hundred years now. And if we want to grow big companies, then it's madness to cut ourselves off from the largest market in the world. Okay. Never chair a panel of dragons would be my advice. <laughs> Sherry, where do we go from here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you reminding you started out 20 years ago, uh, you know, sort of your changed life. I was, I think, 24 years ago when I first met uh, Martin, because at, at the time I was at HBS and we wanted to invite an amazing role model from Europe back to the U.S. to talk to us about changing the world, make, world and making a better place. And you were very kind. You came back, even though you were an extremely busy man. I think at that time. Um, you weren't yet at that time. I think you were number two biggest, uh, biggest most successful uh, company, and, and now you're number one, which is great. That's the tenacity that you're talking about. Um, so uh, you asked me to talk a little bit about um, scaling up companies and where we had to go in a little bit about the scale-up report. So um, last year uh, released a report that talked about a, a sort of myth-busting, and it talked about entrepreneurship, but it also talked about the fact that not just the starting of companies was really important, but it was really important, more important, to grow them. And we uh, showed the causal link between scale-ups and the productivity gap. Uh, and we also showed that there was a negative correlation between starting up companies and growing the economy. 
and teased a few things out of that. We also asked ourselves a question, if we in this country had the same number of scale-ups that they had in other countries, what would that mean? Um, we examined briefly the fact that in 2011 we passed having a greater number of companies started than they even had in America. And you could assume if you start more that that is good news. But actually it's not good news, so we, we examined that. Um, and we asked the question, if we were to grow them to the same extent as some other countries, several other countries, what would it mean? And on a gross basis, it would mean one trillion four hundred billion. In additional, uh, in, in additional income generated for, by the customers buying the innovative products. On a net basis, it was $225 billion uh, and hundreds of thousands of jobs um, without additional investment, but by focusing our resources not on the creating of a new company, but on the growing of those companies that were already successful. Um, we scoured the globe for great examples and was delighted to see that there were some phenomenal examples in the UK. Um, of what you could do that worked. Um, we surveyed scale-ups and said, are you just not as ambitious as others or have you run into some barriers? And thank goodness, um, the myth that they're not as ambitious I think has been squashed forever. Um, and the good news is that we found some barriers that are very addressable by every single one of us in the room um, that if we pull those levers, we can remove the barriers in front of those uh, you know, modern industrials and pave the way for your second or your third uh, your book, which hopefully won't be in 16, 16 years, uh, perhaps written by somebody in the audience. Um, so we, when we surveyed the scales, we found out quickly it wasn't ambition. Um, and we said, well, what's stopping you? And one of the things that they said, and the most important, um, was skills. And we discovered that there were 1.2 million open jobs in the UK at the moment, and that these jobs were incapable of being filled because they couldn't, uh, the people didn't have the right skills that were applying for them. And we thought, well, you can change, we can change that. Um, we can make sure that children and students, young people are attracted to and understand how very, very high impact careers can, can, uh, you know, should be pursued. And I think that every, every single child perhaps in the country should be issued with this. Because um, when I see people around me, I see people running. When I look at children, I think, what business are you going to run? What business will you create and run and grow? Um, the second thing that we found that was stopping the businesses in this country from growing was leadership development. And it seemed to be, because there was a smaller number of people who had grown companies from zero to 25 to 100 to 200 to 2,000, um, it was harder for them to get good advice at the right time when they needed it. Um, there were quite a few people who claimed to be giving advice to startups, but they'd never grown companies. And there's a very large difference uh, in the advice that you receive from someone who has, has actually done it, um, like the gentleman to, um, to our left. Um, the other thing, the third thing that they um, said was holding them back is they found it was very difficult to, to get large contracts, um, not only with the government, but more importantly with large corporates. And, um, and that's a solvable problem because you can teach um, young, ambitious entrepreneurs what they need to do in order to get through the procurement hoops that uh, large companies need to go through. So that's okay, that's a solvable problem, we can fix that. Um, the uh, finance was an issue, it was the fourth most important issue, not the first, not the second, not the third, the fourth. Um, and uh, they, they said it was very hard to get follow on. It wasn't a problem because they were going over to the US and they were getting financing from, from the US. Um, but there is a problem uh, on an economy basis of all of our best entrepreneurs getting financed in the US. And that's because when there is an exit or a flotation, the, in, the funds do not flow back into this country. Um, and so it's, uh, again, it was not a problem on an individual level, but when you work through the systemic implications of them getting finance elsewhere, it was a problem. Um, and infrastructure, it was patchy in the UK, but they claimed that it was very, very hard to find 
real estate that they could easily grow into and that it was very hard to get out of the real estate that they were already growing out of. They didn't necessarily anticipate growing that quickly. They signed three and five year contracts. They then ran out of space and that lowered the productivity because they were in buildings all over the city or all over the country and they were unable to, uh, to, grow, to grow through. The most important ask that we had of, uh, of the government was for evidence to be made available. Um, we wanted them to use the data that they had collected through HMRC and VAT, and when they discovered a company that was growing at 20, 30, 40% per annum for several years, we asked them to celebrate them and congratulate them and ask if they wanted to be put in, you know, be, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, I guess sort of celebrated and in being celebrated, other people could find them um, customers overseas could find their fabulous products. Um, it would allow them to find talent to hire. To hire. Uh, it would allow them to find finance. And maybe it would allow them to go on a registrar of uh, the, the real estate people looked at and said, oh, well, you're growing really, really fast. We will release you from, from this, um, which are some of the examples that we found in other countries uh, of people that helped the ecosystem coming up together to help solve the problems of growth of sh you know, shaping, shaping the nation. Um, so you also said, how do I feel about things now, a couple of years later? Um, I'm not so worried about the infrastructure and the finance is um, coming along nicely. Um, customers emerged, um, selling to large corporates emerged last year when we surveyed the scale-ups again as the largest problem it now surpasses the barrier that they see um, in people having the right skills. Um, leadership development, there's been some good movement on there. The, there's been a number of courses that are now offered that prove that they actually really do help the leaders um, scale up their company, so that's great. Um, skills is still a really large issue, and it's still very, very hard to spot a scale up. Um, these are companies that have been growing for 20 or 30% per annum for several years. That's why they need help with their leadership development, because it's actually really hard to hold the wheels on a bus for several years going. Um, but there's only 0.4% of our business population are, scale up, are scaling up. And um, it's very hard if you aren't trained um, uh, to identify one that is ambitious and does have the innovative pro program. So in releasing the data on who the scale-ups are, um, I think that would be the single biggest um, ask that would have the single biggest benefit for productivity in this nation because it would allow us all to celebrate them. Every single school could invite those entrepreneurs who are building their communities into the class. The real estate people could release them from a, le a, re a lease. The finance people could jump on them and the leadership development courses wouldn't have to research whether or not they were qualified. They could just say, oh, you keep on selling so many things and your customers are the arbiter of choice. That's fantastic. Come on this course. It'll help you. Um, so I think it's still all out there. I think that we will see some good progress, but not all the levers that are available to us to pull um, have yet been pulled. Um, but there's lots of time, or there's not lots of time, there's still time. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing how we all work together as an ecosystem to bust down these barriers that can be busted down and should be busted down so that we can all grow big companies like Sir Martin. So Martin, you've been there, you've done it. Did this well, book resonate? We're trying to do it. I wouldn't say we've been there and done it. So paranoia, paranoia rules. When you, when you start a company with two people in a room much, much smaller than this very grand room, you worry about going back to um, two people in one room. So, so anyway, you changed, you changed the agenda. You, the sort of trouble of doing these panels is, you know, what gets sent you? The actual brief I got was, what are some lessons for leaders in a new global economy? It wasn't quite orientated to create, but I'll, I'll try and adapt it. And let me just make a, one or two comments on what Liam said. First, first of all, the UK economy is not the fifth biggest in the world. Well, it is the fifth big, biggest in the world in absolute terms. But when, when he said it, it reminded me of what happened last week. Um, the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab organized a session on Brexit. And the prime minister gave what was a, a glorified press conference. And um, Klaus, in introducing uh, the prime minister, said that the, the British economy is the 20th or 21st largest in the world. 
and was going to become the 40th largest in the world. I don't think that got reported, actually. It's quite interesting. Of course, Klaus was referring to GDP per capita, which is really the figure that you should focus on. And it's true that we're the fifth absolute. But remember what the projection by the World Economic Forum was. So that's just one observation. The other, your, your quote about, you know, sort of dust your, when you have a reverse, dust yourself down, pick yourself up, and yeah. start all over again. <clears throat> My dad actually had a much better... Um, and I'll come on to my dad in a minute because he's very important to me. Um, in his letter of wishes that I found when, my, <coughs> when he died, um, which he had sent to me when he knew he was sort of uh, uh, going to have a terminal uh, illness, or as he put it, a change in his condition, was um, sometimes the clouds blot out the sun, but have no fear. Uh, have no fear, you mentioned it twice. And there was something, I think it's much better than, uh, with all due respect, your, uh, your, 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 your quote. And uh, the, the, the third thing I want to say is this, you know, this thing about the short term, and we've joined that uh, McKinsey, uh, Dow Chemical, Larry Fink uh, group, which uh, focusing on the long term, is the, the problem, and forgive me for saying this, Liam, but um, it introduces a little bit of uh, a grit into the uh, debate. The trouble is that people who are trying to run large companies have become like politicians. Um, and the reason they become like politicians is there's a simple fact. The average life of a CEO, life expectancy of a CEO as CEO is about six to seven years currently. The average life of a CFO is about five to six years. And a CMO, the, the people, the chief marketing officer, the people that we deal with mostly in our business. The average life, you know, some statistics say four years, but probably the more accurate one in America is about two years. And hallelujah, it's, it's one third more than it was 18 months ago. It's gone up from 18 months to two years. It's what you get, what you would expect, is that people having become leaders of large companies are very sort of focused on the short term. And there's a, there's a wonderful graph that we used, give, give and I used, at the House of Lords, because we launched our 100 top, um, or we didn't launch, we had, for the sixth time, we had our 100 top Chinese brands. And you'll see with the FT, we do the 100 top global brands. We've done it for the last 11 years. There's a wonderful slide which takes the quarterly <coughs> performance of the S&P 500. So it takes the, re the earnings of the S&P 500 every quarter since uh, our graph goes back to 09, beginning of 09, just post Lehman. Lehman was Q3 of 2008. And it plots uh, buybacks and dividends against uh, retained earnings. And buybacks and dividends have steadily increased since the first quarter. It was around 50 to 60% of retained earnings at the beginning of 2009. And in Q1, 2, 3, and 4 of 2015, it surpassed, in, all, in three of the four quarters, it surpassed 100% of retained earnings. So effectively, if you think about the S&P 500 as being one big company, it shrank. And in Q4 of last year, 122% of retained earnings were paid back to shareholders. What are, in buybacks and dividends. What is that telling you? It's telling you that the companies, the, the people who run those companies, think that the funds would be better off in the hands of the shareholders. So everything is short term. And just to throw even more grit into the debate, the, in our experience, the best companies to deal with in this environment are the controlled companies, the companies that offend good corporate governments. We find that the companies where management is assured of continuity, I, and there are some examples that counter this, even currently, but the concept of one man or one woman per vote or per share, one vote per share, is not necessarily a good one because you don't have the, the confidence to make long-term decisions. And Mark Zuckerberg, in his, um, in his, he's just reauthored, rejigged the structure of Facebook again, with, introduced the third class of shares. And his justification for doing that was that control would remain with him and that would enable him to make decisions in the long-term uh, interests of the company. So we have a serious problem and I you know I struggled with economics uh, and there's one book I do remember uh, by a left-wing economist called Robin Maris at, uh, at Cambridge 
and he wrote a, a book called The Theory of uh, Managerial Capitalism, Economic Theory of Managerial Capitalism, as I remember it. And he talked about the separation of ownership and control, and that was a fundamental problem, that when you linked ownership and control, uh, where management had skin in the game, not a good phrase, but their uh, approach was, dif uh, was different. And there is some good academic research to show that there is, you can have too much skin in the game, you can have too little. The happy medium seems to be around 20, 25% for it. But I, I put the, the, my, my own view that this is absolutely fundamental, uh, that one of the biggest problems we have is that there is, still have, is that separation of ownership and control. Now, come back to, to the brief that Liam sent me, you know, what, I, I can't give you any lessons. And I looked at, uh, you know, I read not all of Liam's book, books, otherwise I wouldn't have time to do any work. Um, but, but I will get around to it eventually. But, I, you know, I, I skimmed a, a lot of the stories. I went to the, the heart of it, and it, it, there are five things at the end that he talks about as being sort of common themes. Money makes money, being in the right place at the right time, fold, hold, you know, knowing the when to fold, when to hold, when you're all in, grit and, and trust, which means strategic vision and detail, and you know, changing the world. Um, you know, whilst it's fashionable on that last one to say, you know, the, the young today, and I'm not young, I'm 71, uh, the young you know, are, are primarily focused on changing the world. I think there is some truth in that, but that is not true to say that everybody I went to business school with from 1966 uh, to 68, so it's an awful long time ago, um, were only interested in making money. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So what, what I thought I would do might, in the time left to me uh, is just to run through, just from my personal experience, what the key factors, and the interesting thing is, I, you know, to go to sort of just add a, again a little bit of grit to the, to the discussion, I don't think there are any rules. You know, I don't think that you know, it's all people who, are, who have nothing, who make grand, great entrepreneurs, or all people, you know, all the people, some of your, your, your stories are people who had, came from comfortable, I think you said comfortable backgrounds. Not necessarily super rich, but, but you know, they had money, for, they could raise money. I think it was one case, 2.4 million sticks. But, well, that was the second thing I was yeah. going to come in. There are some people who left school at 15, Richard Branson, etc. There are some people who, you know, spent a lot of time uh, at business school, uh, God forbid, as we, as we all did. We all suffer that burden. My mother thought it was the worst thing I ever did. Um, but let me just tell you, tell you about me, and I, I'm not personalizing it, because I think it, you, you can draw conclusions one way or the other, but I think there are no rules. And, and Sherry says something about um, teaching leadership. I bristle at that. I don't, you know, the, it, there's this old debate about, you know, can you, can you teach leaders, or can you, can you teach people to be leaders or entrepreneurs? I, I'm somewhat cynical about that. I think you can give them guidelines. But I think the, the roots of this are much, much deeper. They're cultural, they're social, um, historical. So just look at me. So my family, I was um, a spoilt uh, only child of uh, Jewish parents in uh, northwest London. I was born in Queensborough Court at Henley's Corner, if anybody knows where that is. And we graduated from what was effectively Golders Green to Mill Hill. Um, my grandparents came from... Uh, from on my father's side from the Ukraine in 1899 and I think this is important detail and when they uh, I found when my mother died the wedding certificate that my father's parents registered when they came from uh, the Ukraine in 1899 uh, they had to cl I think they were married before they got here but they had to re-register their marriage and on the marriage certificate they, they signed with crosses and the four witnesses signed with crosses right? and this is not a uh, you know, poor boy story, because I, I was in a comfortable home because of what my father did. But, but basically, and my mother's parents came from Poland and Romania between the two wars, not before the First World War. I, I go through this because obviously immigration is one of the three buckets that come up in the Brexit debate. I, I think the in is win the economy debate. I think you, know, you can argue 50-50 uh, on the sovereignty, which is the second bucket that I see. 
Uh, I think you're better off arguing from within than without, but that's a matter of debate. The one argument that none of the politicians, that David Cameron last week at the World Economic Forum, I think, studiously avoided talking about it was the, the immigration debate. Uh, I think immigrants are in net benefit to the economy, and I think that's what this campaign should focus on. I, I don't think, I know the political advisors say, focus on the economy, because that's what wins most elections. You know, uh, it's the economy that you focus on, it's in your pocket. You know, we saw that with the Scottish referendum, etc. I, I disagree with that. I think there should be a robust debate about whether immigration, and I say that because I'm emotional about it, because my grandparents came here with my, my nothing. My father had to leave school at 13. He could recite large chunks of Shakespeare and the Talmud to the day he died. And when I say large chunks, I don't mean friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your, your ears. I mean he went on four pages until his dying day at 74. Quite remarkable. If you just think about what he had to do. But he had to go out as a, a member of the family, one of six, to earn a, a living for the family because uh, they, they all had to go out. He had a music scholarship in the Royal College of Music and the violin, which he had to give up. I say that not to encourage sympathy, but because what he did was having been denied an education for me, he gave me uh, the best that he thought he could give me. I went to Haberdashers, I went to uh, Christ Cambridge, I went to Harvard Business School, and that formulated me. As I said, my mother thought going to Harvard Business School was the worst thing uh, that, that, that could happen to me. But what it did do, and I think this is really very important, um, when I was at B School, you know, every day we had three case studies. You know, what should the chairman and CEO of these big companies, mainly the big companies, we'd had small, uh, we had entrepreneurial, course elective in the second year, it's true, but basically is what should big companies, see, chairman and CEOs do and why? why? And what I became uh, absorbed with is not wanting to start a company and then sell it, but to start a company and then build it. What I was intrigued with was questions of scale. And um, there are some people who are good at starting things and not running things. There are some people who are good at running things and not starting things. I wanted to do both. And that's you know, when I said uh, to you, you know, we're still in the process of doing it, we are still in the process of doing it. So that background is really important. The other thing I would say is at business school, one of the things they did say, they talked about balance and the importance of balance. Three circles that intersect is a sort of a Venn diagram. Your career, your family, and society. And I, I would admit that I haven't been able to balance all three but I think it's important to understand that you have to balance all three. And I think actually this generation is much better at balancing all that, those three. I can, I can justifiably claim to have done two of those reasonably well, but, you know, or one out of the three at certain times, but I haven't managed to do, to do all three. Strong education, Dad gave me that because he didn't have it. Travel, I, I traveled with Simon Sharma. I remember when we were at Cambridge together both behind the Iron Curtain, as it then was, uh, and to America. We went to the convention in 1964 in Atlantic City. I mention that because it has parallels to what's happening in America now. It's the last time we had an extreme right candidate. You remember Barry Goldwater? And it will be interesting to see whether the result is the same as Barry Goldwater. I think Goldwater lost, or the Democrats won in 44 states. We'll see whether that happens again or not. Sometimes, somehow I think it will not be the case, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, my father's advice to me, it was obviously seminal to me, mentors are really important. Um, my dad was my mentor. When he died, a lawyer became my mentor. I guess my mentor today is, uh, is my wife. But having somebody who can give you an objective view that does not have an agenda uh, you know, if you consult people inside the company or advisors sometimes outside, they have an agenda and they have a bias, either conscious or unconscious. And it's really important, I think, to have somebody that you can do. My dad said to me, find something you, can, you enjoy, an industry you enjoy. Build a reputation, not a reputation where you get invited by Liam to sit in the RSA and talk to people. I don't mean that. But, you know, that people develop some sort of degree of confidence in what you do. And if you feel like starting your own business, go out and do it. I did it at the age 40, so I would be sort of atypical. Most entrepreneurs start earlier, 40 years old, really. 
Um, but 40 actually is a very interesting age. When I was 40, you look back at the first 20 years of your, your career and you looked at the next, you thought you were going to retire when you were about 60, and you looked at the next 20, and it was a, it's a critical point. Jeremy Bullmore, who's still an advisor to WPP, used to be chairman of JWT, said we should have a little flag on everybody's computer inside WPP you know, three months before the 40th birthday, because that's when the trouble starts, you know, when people start to, to, to reflect. Um, calculated risk. I think Liam's book is spot on on this. So we've been running WPP, started with two people in the room in Lincoln's in Fields, not far from here. We did 18 acquisitions in 18 months. We had a shell company, Wire and Plastic Products, with a million pounds market cap. I think we were up to about 150 million pounds within about 18 months and more. You know, it's better to travel than arrive, as the, the old saw. And uh, you know, the, the, the share price had risen in anticipation. So we've gone from one million pounds market cap to 150 in about uh, 18 months. And JWT, J. Walter, JWT Group, was in a spot of trouble with clients, with people and share owners, and I won't bother you with the details. But it was 13 times our size. Uh, I owned personally in WPP at that time 16% of the equity. And the decision, so this is a company 13 times our size. Uh, we were capped at, say, 150, call it $250 million, uh, with the takeout price at the end was $525 million. So, and we did a one-for-one -one rights issue, and the rest was debt. So the choice to me, and it comes back to your, your question about the big de these big decisions and you know, the, whether you've, you're all in, the, but this was the basic decision. Do I own 16% of an unleveraged company, this is personally, unleveraged company, um, which was a 13th of the size of a company, which, well, I mean, j was losing money. Actually, we were making money, ironically, even, they were losing money, even though they were 13 times our size but with a bit of debt. So 16% without debt, a 13 times size company, 8% with some debt. Now, luck, Liam also mentions in his book the importance of luck. Luck is really important. So my dad used to say you make your own, your own luck. Maybe, maybe not. We knew that it was a freehold property in JWT. We paid $525 million for the, for the company and within uh, 12 months to 18 months, we, we, we found this freehold property. They had, we knew they had a freehold property which they depreciated on the balance sheet. In those days, you used to write off freehold property by 2.5% a year over 40 years. So what you had was a lot of companies, the asset strippers like James, uh, Jim Slater, like uh, Goldsmith and others, uh, used to strip companies because they had depreciated property assets. We saw this on the balance sheet, but we thought it was in London. We thought it was Barclays Square. When we got in, we found it was in Tokyo. And we sold it for $200 million about 12 months after we bought the company. Now, we had to pay 50% capital gains tax, but it means the price was reduced for $525 million to $425 million. We deleveraged the company within about 18 months, and, and all was good. So I, I just talk about calculated risk is really important. And I think... Good entrepreneurs, and the book is great on this, um, the, the Dragon's book in that. Um, cyclical, cyclicality. Anybody in this room outside that believes that, that life, economic life is not cyclical, think again. In the moment you think that things aren't cyclical is when the trouble starts. Companies are cyclical, families are cyclical, people are cyclical, marriages are cyclical, countries are cyclical, regions are cyclical. Geographies are cyclical, and I think the basic problem, I hate to be negative about this, is that we can't come to terms with the fact that history is against us. The flip side is also true. The last 200 years, China has been on the wrong side of history. It is now on the right side of history. Go back and look at worldwide GDP in the early 19th century, and you will get a shock. Because China and India, at that time, we're about 40% of worldwide GDP, which is where they will be, despite all the current stuff, in my view, you know, because the brick markets have become a, a vice rather than a, a virtue in the last few years. That's how fickle and short-term everybody. You can't reverse a company's strategy in two to three years because it's nonsense. And the 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion people in China are where those entrepreneurs are going to come. And what the, the, the imperative for us is even greater because we are now, in my view, at a historical 
disadvantage, but cyclicality, we acquired JWT, it looked wonderful. In 89, we acquired Ogilvy, which was about twice our size at that time. I thought it was a rerun. I'm saying I because I take responsibility. We over-leveraged the company, and we had a near-death experience in 91, too, where we had to recapitalize the company and did a debt for equity swap. So the crisis, you know, pick yourself, dust your dust, the, sh you know, the clouds blot out the sun, uh, applied to me, too. Um, another thing that I think is really important, I really do believe, and that's our business, in long-term brand building. I do not believe that flitting from flower to flower, which is the conventional wisdom today, that, you know, that people believe that in order to build a career, what you have to do is go from company to company, from flower to flower, and pick up knowledge or pollen, whatever the right analogy is, from, from one to the other. I do not believe in that. Uh, again, this comes from my father. My father said, invest in the company. He said, portfolio investment is a mugs, mugs game. It's gambling. He said, invest in the company that you are in, that is where you have some degree of certainty. And I think that's absolutely fine. And what we're doing at WPP and is long-term brand building. We've been at this for 31 years. And uh, you know, obviously, I'm coming towards the end of my, uh, my uh, involvement with the company. But essentially, it's a long-term exit. It's not five or six years. It's not six or seven years, and then on to the next. This is a long-term brand building. So I do not believe in flitting. <laughs> And by the way, those of you who are starting a company, don't go to venture capitalists and don't go to private equity firms. No, seriously, because they have the highest cost of capital. Steve Schwarzman said to me, Martin, never come to Blackstone for money because their internal rates of return are 20% or 15%. You know, they're, they're issuing funds now to private equity people. Lower returns demanded for longer-term investment, they say. Still the internal rates of return are 15% by far the most expensive sources of finance. And the final point I make you'll be glad to know is about change. If you're in the long-term brand building business, which we are, because that's our business and that's what we want to do, what you have to do is to be adaptable. And it's very easy to say, I mean, we're 190,000 people in 112 countries, a market cap of $30 billion. Uh, we started at $1.5 million uh, 31 years ago. And it's very easy to say that, but, but what we're trying to do is run our company, and we are bureaucratic, it's true, but in a much more entrepreneur, entrepreneurial way. So what do you do? You do three things. First of all, you have your traditional businesses. In our case, we're trying to make them more digital, and you push them very hard. You then have your digital businesses, which you push to go even faster. I'm taking digital or far. You could apply it to fast growth markets, you know, more BRICS, more Next 11 for the traditional businesses, the ones that are Western European or US orientated. Push your, your, your fast growth market businesses. And last, and this is really the most important, be prepared uh, for what we call cannibalization. In other words, if you don't eat your children, somebody else will. So you better invest in new technologies, new countries, new operations, and sort of run a strategic private equity or strategic venture capital company. So that's, you know, that's some of the things that stick out in my mind as I read Liam's book in relation to my own experience, and maybe it'll stir one or two thoughts in you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm going to surrender my privileges as chair, and I'm going to go straight to the audience. And we're going to take a bank of quick fire, quick fire questions. So we can get at least two rounds in. I'm going to take this lady here, the gentleman at the back. And I'm going to take this gentleman here. Thank you. Most enjoyable. I'm completely out of my depth. I write for entrepreneurs, and some key things came out there: role models, mentors, and barriers. But I think perhaps you missed the 11th person in your entrepreneurs, Dame Stephanie Shirley. No women at all in the book. Where are the role models? Where are the mentors? What are the barriers for the entrepreneurs of the future? I predicted that was going to be the first question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's the right question. Ian, Ian Dodds, um, it seems to me that um, possibly since the 1980s, we've been in a transactional age. And I believe Professor Michael Porter 
has actually commented on this and said short-term capitalism has failed and what we need is long-term shared stakeholder value capitalism where you look after the long-term interests of all of the stakeholders not just the short-term interests of the shareholders and it seems to me uh, that if you do that you have a transformational age and it's transformational approaches that actually help organizations to scale up. Okay, thank you very much. And then there was one more down here. So ownership and control. Families do that. Um, we talk a lot about individuals, but family businesses tend to do better, last longer. They have their own problems, uh, but they've been real drivers of growth. How do they fit in? Oh, I chair the Family Firms Institute, so I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, where were the women yeah, entrepreneurs? Brilliant. So, this was a debate that I went through when trying to put together the, um, the, the, the jigsaw puzzle. And actually, the conclusion that I came to is that I wanted to make a point. That actually, what 600 years of business history teaches you is that actually women have been systematically frozen out of what has been a patriarchal power structure for a long, long time. Now, it's beginning to change. But actually, one of the interviews I did for the conclusion is with Martha Lane Fox, who makes the point that if you look at the IT industry, it's a new industry, it's created in the last 30, 40 years. Actually, if you look at the number of women at the top of that industry, it's very, very few indeed. So have things changed? Well, perhaps not enough. And so one of the conclusions I think that I draw from this debate um, about things that government has got to do differently is you've got to have enterprise education in schools um, but you have got to make sure that that is delivered in a way that actually inspires young women like my daughter to go into creating those new industries and new jobs uh, of the future so in in a way i kind of wanted to make the point and actually women emerge in the story as counselors and often capital givers so matthew bolton invests an awful lot of his wife's money uh, for example, and that story does kind of recur um, down the centuries, but actually it was a deliberate point um, that I ended up making. Um, I think just on the, the, the question about um, Mike Porter, I mean, I was taught by Mike, I don't know if you were uh, too um, at Harvard, but Martin's point that you've, we have got to find ways of injecting a longer term focus in boardrooms is now, I think, one of the top two or three issues um, in the way our economies run. The average shareholding now in this country is down to, is down to six months. Um, and that can't be divorced from the fact that companies, big companies, aren't investing in new industries of the future. UK corporates are sitting on 522 billion in cash right now. And that's after they paid out 100 billion in share buybacks in 2014. So that long-term focus that, that Martin talked about, I just, we haven't cracked it. What the right answer is, whether it's Mike's answer, Michael Porter's answer or not, you'll know better than me but something ain't working now. Well, I mean, the, the academic stuff, you know, Clay Christensen, you know, a, a brother professor at, at HBS, uh, and Roger Martin from, from Canada, um, have this, this, this stuff about, the trouble is that innovation tends to be incremental rather than fundamental. But, you know, it is understandable. I mean, there are three sets of statistics that, that I think are really important. The first is what I said about CEO. Uh, longevity or lack of it. The second is the world is growing at three to three and a half percent. You said this, Liam. Uh, the three to three and a half percent is real versus nominal. The giveaway is that the, the nominal correction, in other words, inflation is only 50 basis points or half a percent at the moment or close to it, which means there's very little inflation, which means it's a focus on cost, which means because clients don't have pricing power. And so that's another thing. So the new normal is slow growth, no growth no inflation, no pricing power, focus on cost, finance and procurement rule. 50% of the CEOs of the FTSE 100, I think it's still true to say, are CFOs like, like myself. The third killer one is what Liam also touched on. If you're, you're running a legacy business, you have a spectrum of disruption at one end, Airbnb and Uber of the spectrum. The other end of the zero-based cost budgeters, you know, the 3G capitals, the Reckitt Benkeezers, that doesn't mean that they're not effective companies, what, what they do is put pressure on the cost side of the equation. And in the middle, you have the activist investors. You know, don't forget that Nelson Peltz really forced Dow and DuPont together, creating a $120 billion company, which is going to be demerged into three smaller companies. And what's happening in Bear Monsanto is about, in part, cost-based effectiveness. In fact, when Lex, or Breaking Views, analyzes an acquisition, it's really interesting. When you see the, st the statistical analysis in the newspapers, or digitally, 
what do they say? They say the cost synergies are X. They tax them, they apply the appropriate multiple, and if the resultant sum is greater than the premium, great deal. If it's less, lousy deal. And if anybody talks about revenue synergies, they're dreamland. I want to bring in uh, Sherry. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so I think what you really meant to say is your second book was going yeah. to be um, <laughs> starting we with sell Dame. Of these outside. Um, so, um, uh, but the, I, I, it's, uh, I like the fact that you've mentioned Dame Shirley. I studied her as a case study when I came over here from Canada at the London School of Economics, and that is what tipped me into seeing entrepreneurship as my, my career choice. Um, just in terms of ro role models and mentors, um, as a shameless plug at the Founders for Schools, but um, we uh, have a platform we created for teachers that allow them to choose the women business leaders and get them into the class, and it triples the percentage of uh, students that choose STEM. Um, just by having exposure and access to the people who build businesses, some of them small, some of them you know, not so small, but all of them growing, makes an enormous difference in, in the lives of these, uh, these children, some of whom won't have, won't have met them in their own family. Um, and just to Michael Porter for a second, he supervised my thesis, um, and he also endorsed the, the, the report um, and said that... Um, what he liked about it was the ecosystem, the systemic approach that had the long term and the short term. And the fact that we led with education is because it was a long term lever that we all had to pull and that nobody had um, all of the answers that we had to work together. Teachers have to bring business leaders into their classroom. You mentioned executive um, leadership. I didn't mean teaching leadership. What has shown to be effective is leaders like um, you and others going in and mentoring and coaching and talking to those that are a little bit further down, down the lane. And that peer-to-peer peer -peer advice is what seems to work, uh, and that's what we recommended happening throughout the UK. Um, and it does seem to have a phenomenal impact, because what we do isn't written in books, but it is in the heads of other individuals, and we can learn from each other um, as a community. Sorry. So this family, family companies. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So, well, you know, I think a good example is Germany. You know, the Mittelstadt, often are, and northern Italy. I mean, not, not fashionable to talk about that, but you see strong family companies, and I'm, I'm a great believer in that. And I actually, I think heavily investing in your own company and reducing the separation between ownership and control, which you see, as you're right, as the questioner said, you see most, it is most acute form in family companies. I mean, it can lead to problems, obviously, dynastically, you know, clogs to clogs in three generations. But, but I do think it's fundamental, and I think we've lost sight of that. Yeah, it's a lesson actually that recurs down the centuries. So Robert Rich, the first big chapter, happens to inherit the biggest privateering fleet in England. That's where his fortune starts. But, you know, Matthew Bolton inherits his dad's business. John Speed and Lewis inherits his father's business. So it, it's definitely a pattern down the centuries. I was thinking of both Pico turned around the, uh, the fortunes of, uh, of, that, of that champagne <laughs> company. Um, and that was a woman. There's a, another, yeah. ch another chapter for your, um, for your book. So um. this discussion and debate is going to continue for a long time yet. Um, but for tonight, I'm afraid it's going to have to be over a drink. Um, we've run out of time, but thank you very much to Samartin Sorrell, Sherry Kutu, and Liam Byrne. The books, as I say, are available. I'm sure Liam will sign a few for you, um, and the discussion will continue long beyond this point. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.